Amos, 92 um, years ago, the Friedrich Rebbe was released from prison. And as you all know, a major part of his efforts, which is why he was arrested in the first place, and of course the liberation was around chinuch, an education of children, to Nekeshel Beis Rabban. Actually, an entire mimer called uh, the Kibla Yehudim, that year, Tafresh Pezai in 1927, that the Friedrich Rebbe said in Moscow, where he talks very strongly about the importance of being moist and nefesh, sacrificing and doing everything possible to preserve the integrity of the education of our young children, because our young children will be our future adults and future leaders. You can look up the mimer. I'm not going to go into that. I just wanted to connect it to this day's opportune time to talk about this. But it's interesting to note, and maybe this is a good segue, that even though the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, and all the Rabbeim were Chabad Rabbeim, and their primary way of teaching was through Chsidis, and yet when the time came, because they were also true leaders, they had to defend and protect, even when it came down to the education of little children, which you can say maybe is not necessarily related directly to learning Chsidis, because that age doesn't yet understand Chassidus, and yet it goes hand in hand. And I think that's a good way to uh, segue into what I will be speaking about, and that is that Chassidus is not just an optional part of the Torah, not just another part of the Torah, but actually is the soul, the neshama of Torah. And if you don't have a neshama in Torah, we all know a body without a soul is called, I don't want to sound morbid, but it's called a corpse. And the same thing is in Teda. And once the Rabbeim, starting from the Baal Shem Tev, and then later, the, the, Mag, the Magad, of, the Mizritcha Magad, the Alter Rebbe, and the Mitla Rebbe, and the Tzamech Tzedek, Rebbe Marash, the Rebbe Rashab, the Fridik Rebbe, as I just mentioned, and our Rebbe, what they did was, made it into an entire comprehensive blueprint for how you teach this Neshama of Teda to all people of all ages, men, women, and children, and how it's a vital component, as I said, not optional, but actually necessary for the survival of the Jewish people. Because nothing less than that would be a reason for the Rabbeim to have such dedication and spend so much time in writing and delivering chassidus. So even though most people learn chassidus or look open up the books, find it abstract and inaccessible, but this is what the Rebbe's did all day almost. If you look disproportionate to everything else was their teaching, writing, delivering chassidus. So you have to conclude from that that they, singly, they, they saw that as the single most important thing that you could do for the Jewish people and for the chassidim. You could think, why didn't they just have a lot of yechidis, parents, adop, singles, everyone who had their issues, whether it was educational issues or others, just come see the rebbes. No, the Alter Rebbe wrote a tanya. And though he did give advice individually, but ultimately the doctrine that they left, the Rabbeim left, in which they infused and they etched their own souls into, as we say, non nafshik sovis yovis was chassidus. So what we conclude from that is that chassidus has in it directives and guidelines that address every aspect of life. And we're focusing now is primarily chinuch, education, and especially education of our children. So someone would ask the question, what does chassidus have to say that the Torah doesn't have to say? When I say Torah, I mean Torah, so to speak, without chassidus. I'm going to address that, and above all, how you can take from chassidus and glean from it exactly what the Rebbe's, the Rebbeim wanted, which is how you turn it into a viable and practical guide, teaching us and educating us and empowering us with the ability to educate our children, infuse them, and literally shape their lives into what God wants of each one of us, what the Tate expects of each one of us, what the Rabbeim expect of all of us. So I think the first step to begin, before we get into some specifics, which I will get into, is what is chassidus? What is chassidus? You know, you know, many of us may think that it's a, it's a given, everyone knows what it means. I would submit, no, I've talked to many, many audiences. I'm not talking about secular audiences and people who never heard what chassidus is. Even our own community, very hard. How, what is chassidus? Is it a doctrine? Is it study? Is it scholarship? Is it action-based? Is it educational? Is it a curriculum? 
What is chassidus exactly? Besides, of course, we all know the prerequisite part, as I said, the neshama of teira, and that it consists of a lot of uh, information and uh, teachings. But what does it teach? What is its asen- essence? So the Rebbe actually has a kuntus that you may be familiar with called in Yonah Shol Teres Achsidus, where he, where he begins with that question. It's based on a talk the Rebbe delivered, Yutas Kislev Tavshin Chavov, should be exact, approximately the end of 1965. It became a whole doctrine, a whole book, booklet. The Rebbe edited it and it became very a core, essential teaching of what Chassidus is. Just giving a source. I'm not going to obviously review everything there. It's, a, it's pretty in-depth. But the way I would put it in simple English, without relying on Hebrew words, and as we, as we shall see, that the real way you appreciate Teir B'chlal and Chassidus specifically is when you're able to articulate it in simple English, that someone does not, it's not prohibitive, and someone does not, not need to know the Hebrew language or even Torah language, because that alone already means it's limited, it's limited only to those that speak that language. To speak in simple English, what Chassidus says, the best way I can articulate it, based on these sources that I just cited and more, is this. Chassidus is a comprehensive blueprint, essentially a guidebook of how to live your life to the fullest, and living up to the mission for which you were created. And that mission is that God sent you to this world, sent your soul to this earth, to some way transform your corner of the world, not just to be a taker, but to be a giver, to use the skills and, uh, and, and skills and gifts that we were blessed with and opportunities to make a, what we call dira b'tachtenim, a home, a divine home from a material corner of the world in which you live. So that's a general mission for all of us, but each of us does it specifically through our unique opportunities or places we live in the world and our particular skills. So if we could say, what is the objective of a chassidish school? What kind of students do you want to produce? So if you go to a public school, or a school that's a secular school, they'll say, the best schools will say, their objective is, is to educate the children to become students that can go into Ivy League colleges and get the best possible jobs, whether it's in medicine or law or accounting or science or whatever it may be. Some will also add character development, making them into people who will be productive citizens. What would be the mission of a chassidish school? What would be the end product? If a parent came to you and said, tell me, what's the end product? What, what do you expect? What's the dream you would like? Obviously, there's no guarantees, but what is the school trying to do? The answer would be is to, is to shape and influence the child to be a passionate and productive, proactive Jew that will not just be committed to building a family, but also committed to in some way change their community and the environment in which they live. With what? With godliness, with what the God expects of us, meaning whoever they meet. That's a very uh, admirable objective, and it's one that you may not hear if you ask another school, which is not even a from school, that may not have chassidus in it. They may say just to be a shomet Torah mitzvah, or to prepare for a big share in the world to come. But here, it's not that way. It's very clearly, it would be or the words of the Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab, that the Rebbe quotes so often, that we're all Yetzel, Kalkola Yetzel, and Melchemes Beis David. And this is for boys and girls to go out in a spiritual war, a spiritual battle against the selfishness and egotistic nature of materialism, and to turn this world into a spiritual environment, a home for God, a garden, Bosiligani, which is preparing the world for Mashiach, when the world will be exactly that, a world filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. And lo yi eser kola elam, the business of the world will be nothing but to know God. That means, not that the material world will disappear, but materialism will not be an end in itself. In other words, making money won't be an end in itself. Careers won't be an end in itself. It'll all be an end, a means toward some divine expression and divine experience in this world. In more, if you want to put it in more spiritual terms, a state of higher spiritual consciousness and awareness. But as it manifests in this particular world. Now, so, you see, I didn't use the word Torah Mitzvah even. So say, well, wait, how'd you cut that out? Very simple, because Torah and Mitzvah is the way to do it. Torah and Mitzvah are the tools. Torah is the books and the, the doctrine that teaches us what God wants of us, and Mitzvah is the, is the tools of actualizing it. And if you want to read the third pillar called prayer, Tefillah, Aveda, that's the emotional uh, education, emotional training that helps us emote with God, helps us connect, which is what davening is all about. And these three pillars are the way that we actualize this vision and this purpose for which we were created. So now, if you set that in, in place, 
Then the question is, okay, so what does Chassidus teach us in achieving that? And how can we translate that into really day-to-day practical curricula, um, courses, uh, even behavior, you know, guidelines. Based on that, what would be the guidelines of a good school and of a good teacher? What, how are they teaching? What are they teaching? And so on. Obviously, I'm not going to address curriculum per se as in what to teach and what exactly should be a curriculum. Every school has to determine that. That's not my expertise. But I will talk about more about what is the spirit of the teaching and what is the things you want to convey because you can teach Chumash and history and uh, Tanakh and Halacha, Shulchan Aruch and Jewish life many ways. You can teach them as facts, a lot of information, and in a way that's not even relevant to the person, or you can teach them in a way that is very relevant and personal. So it's not about the what we're teaching now, we're talking about how to teach, which is far more what Chassidus addresses. As I said, the soul. Because just like a body can't be without a soul, a soul cannot be without a body. So I'm not really addressing in this session what the body consists of, Teda. That we all know, that's what we know, we should know. That's the mechanics of halacha, mechanics of Teda, starting from all the Rishenim, Achrenim, everything that till this day. But Chassidus has another dimension that it adds to it, and that's what I am obviously addressing. So what I just laid out here is really more of a general, I could say like the overall picture, but we have to get into specifics, obviously. Now, there are many, many specifics, and I'm trying to distill it in an hour session or so into something that we can t- come away with as concrete. So I decided to, turn, to break it into five key components which is basically five key, we'll call it um, the methodology of chassidus as it per- per- pertains to education. And of course, this applies especially educational institutions, schools, and so on, but also, frankly, parents and children. And if you really broaden it, it's really even when adults teach adults, it's also an educational process. But my focus here is obviously, I know what this conference is about, so it's broad, but nevertheless, it would try to keep it to that type of um, focus and scope. And the five things, actually, I was looking for an acronym. I always like acronyms. And I almost got the word Rebbe there, but I couldn't find the second B. So I'm working on that. So it's a work in progress. But, you know, acronyms is just a cute uh, gimmick. It's not really the Teichen. But the five things, that I'll, I'll spell them out, and then I'll elaborate on them. And then, of course, break it down into specifics. And also, I will show you, the best of my ability, where I took it from. Not just my a nice idea. That this, in a way, is like a summary of what Chassidus wants to teach us in the context of uh, education. So the five things, even though I remembered well the Rebbe Fabrengans, I don't always remember my own ideas as well. So let me just look at them. I wrote them down. So the first, I'm going to not, I don't know if it's order of priority, but I just, the order I wrote them down. Empowerment, big picture, root versus symptoms. I'll break it down in a moment. Relevance and empathy. Okay. Root, root. I got R E R R. I got E B R R E. The problem is, I want to get the R to become a B, and I couldn't figure out a word. It's irrelevant to this discussion. It's com- I'll go. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go into detail. Trust me. I'm not. I didn't finish my talk. I'm just beginning. I'm sorry. I'll go again. Empowerment. Big picture. Root, as versus symptoms, as I'll explain. Relevance and empathy. And then I'll, I'm going to give you a little more details on each one, and then I'm going to go into more depth of each one of these five. Again, this is what I'm saying is not a detail in Chassidus like uh, a maimah that talks about Simpson Arishan or about Atsilis or about refining your uh, emotions or what davening means. I'm talking about an overall summation of Chassidus approach to education, to life really, but in our case specifically to education. So the first one to break it down, empowerment, which is contrasted with informa- versus information. In other words, you can teach someone information or you can empower them. Another way of putting it is teaching them methodology versus teaching them facts. And finally, a third way, this is all in the first one, character development versus data. If you think about it, I just said three different ways of expressing it, but basically, and I'm going to elaborate now what this means. And this is coming directly from a, a many, many sikhs of the Rebbe, but when you know chsidis, meaning before the sikhs, you see it in you see it in almost all the texts, either directly or indirectly. And that is that when you teach someone, the Rebbe has a sikha on the mission in Pirkei Ovis. It says, Vihimidu Talmidim Harbe. 
that the Anshe Knesset Sagdela, who were the great assembly that followed Moshe Kibbal Tere Messinaim, Messar Ali Yeshua, Yeshua the Skenim, Skenim the Nevi'im, and Nevi'im the Anshe Knesset Sagdela. So you have the direct Messara, the direct chain. So the Anshe Knesset Sagdela, as we know, they organized a lot of Yiddishkeit, a lot of Tere, and, and began preparing it to what it would become the system as we know it today. They, they established the first prayers, established even the Haggadah, you know, other things like that. So even before Tanoim and Amaraim, we're not talking yet even Mishnah. So they said three things, and one of them is Vihimidu Talmidim Harbe. Three things that the Mishnah, right in the beginning of Perik Aleph, Perik Yobis. So the question is, what means Vihimidu Talmidim Harbe? And since they said it, and they put it into three things, and we're talking about this, it means that must be fundamental. Himidu is a strange word. It should say, You should educate many students. You should inspire many. Himidu means to raise, to make them stand. Like, what's the point of making students stand? We're talking about physically standing? It's obviously not. So the Rebbe explains it with the same idea that the Posik in Baha'u'llah, the first Posik in Chumash, in the Parsha Baha'u'llah, rather, Baha'u'llah is so Rashi asks, again, Baha'u'llah means to raise the flames. We don't say raise the flames, you kindle flames. Bahad l'kaischa, had l'kas haneris, we say. We don't say halah in the, the bracha and other places. You kindle, you ignite. So Rashi says, because the mitzvah was, to to the point that the flames rise on their own. And that's why halah. Not just kindle, but make sure that the flame has enough to rise on its own, even if you're not there anymore. And the Rebbe asks the question, these are in Baha'u'llah different sikhs. What's the big thing? If the Kayan God will lighting the menorah, the worst possible scenario is he'll light it, it'll burn out, it'll come back and light it again. Why? The Torah has to change a word in order to make this point? So yes, because lighting the menorah, the Rebbe explains, is a central theme in Yiddishkeit. Ne'er Hashem nishma sodom, every one of us is like a flame. Every child is a flame, the soul, and our job is to ignite to light that flame. But you can just light the flame, and then the flame doesn't have power to rise on its own. It constantly needs its teacher or educator or parent to answer questions. So that's why the Torah comes and changes the word and says, no, make sure that when you educate and, it's, and, and illumine and light the flames of other souls, that they can be sustained even if you're not there. In simple English, it means that you can teach a student the answers to questions, but you don't teach them how to answer questions. So they constantly need to come back to the teacher. They need to come back to the one that lit the flame. They stand on their own, which means that you give them such an education that they can now go out in the world, wherever they will be, and find the answers because you've taught them not just facts, but you've taught them methodology. You empowered them, not just gave them information. You have, um, what was the third thing I said? I forgot already. Yeah, right. You've developed their character and not just given them a lot of facts. This doesn't negate facts, knowledge, data, information. But it's not an end in itself. It's all for a purpose. So in simple terms, if you're a teacher and the students that come out of your class learned a lot of information and even memorized it all, but they are incapable of solving a problem of their own at the age that they're at, obviously relative to where they are, from a chassidisha point of view, it would have been, I can't say failure, but it wouldn't be the optimal success because you haven't had empowered them. They'll leave the school, with maybe a lot of information, which they may or may not retain, and when it comes to real life issues, they may not have an answer. And I'll just tell you personally what I've heard from so many shluchim and shluchis, especially in the last few years, when people talk a little more openly, they say, you know, I went to yeshiva, talk about shluchim and shluchim, went to chabad yeshivas and systems, and I, I don't know how to use chassidus to address the issues of my community. People come to me with a shalom bias issue, or they come to me with an issue with their children, or their own personal things, I have to send them to a therapist. I mean, I try to be nice, I try to be kind, but I'm not equipped. And then I say to myself, one second, all these things I learned, I don't know how to translate it into tools, how to advise, and how to even communicate properly. Now, I'm not suggesting everyone is in that category, but many will say some people who cap are capable of doing it is not because they learned it in our schools, because they just have natural psychological um, acumen and sensitivity, not because they were taught. The truth is, chassidus is a methodology that teaches exactly that, how to empower people. We're going to talk about the four other things, and you'll see how it's all part of that. But this is an objective, 
And if you look in the, the language of Chassidus, look at the Sefer Tanya, Teir Shebek Sav of Chassidus, the Alter Rebbe himself, what does he say? He says this book he wrote in order to give advice, since there's no time to speak to everyone individually, to put it all in a book that includes all the advice you'll ever need in Avedis Hashem. In the broad sense, it means every issue, every psychological, emotional, spiritual issue a person can have. He's not saying it's not a book that's, you know, we're not talking about medical or clinical situations. They were, the Torah says clearly you go to a doctor. We're talking about things like he deals with depression and he deals with anger and deals with jealousy and deals with uh, even things you could even say bullying, even though he doesn't use that word, but the ideas are all there. And he says clearly. And then he goes further and he says, and if you don't find the answer, what does he say? Go to the G'delim Shebe'ir. G'delim in Hebrew means the great ones, the big ones, in the city, and ask them. So you just see how serious he is. In other words, you don't find it, go to somebody that can help you find it. I always wondered what would the word G'delim Shebe'ir is, and I never saw an answer. The Rebbe doesn't address, doesn't address it, or the other Rebbe's, what means G'delim? It's a, it's, a, it's a unique word, because he doesn't say Rabboni Ha'ir, rabbis, which L'chayr would be, or Mashpim, or Madrichim, or Mechanchim. Doesn't use the regular word, G'delim, usually G'deli Yisrael means the leaders in the city. Now, what about today when people of us will say there's a leadership crisis? What leaders? Are they G'delim or are they just in positions where G'delim belong? You know, it doesn't mean that they're G'delim. So I thought about it, and this is completely my own, my own thought, what they call Yeshlemer Bederach Efsher, that perhaps the Alter Rebbe was very, very precise. G'delim is a word in halacha. A godl is a mature person. A cotton is an immature person. You say cotton, so one becomes a godl whether it's a bas mitzvah for a girl at 12 or a boy at, four, four, at 13, what's a godl? That means beginning to develop emotional maturity. So perhaps the Alter Rebbe is really just saying exactly as it is. I'm not talking to you to go to rabbis or to scholars or to book smart people. Go to emotionally astute, emotionally mature, intelligent people, what they call today emotional intelligence. Because you're looking for answers that address our personal issues. You don't find it directly in Tanya. So that's the way to do it. So if you look at Chassidus like that, it changes the whole picture. It's not just a book of mysticism or a book of spiritual ideas and abstract ideas. It's actually, as the Alter Rebbe said, Lekute Amorim Lekute Eitzis. It's a book of advice. I know it sounds almost like simplistic. The Alter Rebbe wrote a self-help book, you know, a book of how-to advice, but he calls it Eitzis. You give me a better translation for the word Eitzis. Now, the Maimorim of the Alter Rebbe in Lukuta Teira, Teira Eir, Lukuta Teira, and the Rabbeim does not necessarily say it's Eitzis only. There, there is a doctrine. But the Alter Rebbe Tanya, he made it very clear it's Eitzis. Within the Eitzis, the Alter Rebbe is a Ben Teira, like the Alter Rebbe, a Godel Ben Teira, does not just write advice. So it's completely surrounded by Teira and scholarship and so on. But the end of the result of it is advice. If you think of the first book of Tanya, the first 52 chapters, is essentially in one word you could say, who is a human being? What makes us tick? The two souls, the battles between good and evil, between selfishness and selflessness. And how do you deal with that battle? How do you overcome it? How do you develop self-control? How do you develop and access the inner soul that's inside everybody? That's really what I just said sums up most of the Tanya. I know it sounds simple because the words I said are simple. How to do it is not that simple. But that's what the Alter Rebbe does. He explains what makes us tick. We have two voices inside of us, and who does not have that? Every one of you, every one of us, every student, every child from birth will have two voices. Or he call it two souls. I'm specifically using this language because to show, demonstrate that the same tiny that we hear so often and, we, and become so lofty, yes, in Shnefer Shalakis, Shnefer Shabamis, as soon as you use those words, right away we go back into our default state of words that we've heard so many years and we almost like dismiss it because we don't find it necessarily personally relevant. But when you hear one second, it's the voice that we say every day to our children, whether in school or home, that you will always have two options. Are you going to be kind or are you going to be selfish? Are you going to be giving or are you going to take? Are you going to hurt someone else or are you going to help someone else? That is, in simple language, nefesh alikis nefesh is at work. Are you going to be impulsive or are you going to be reflective? And on and on and on. So the first thing we covered here, therefore, is not just a book. Tanya is not just a book of ideas. You know, Rambam, for example, Mishnah Teda did not come to create an idea, a methodology, how to be a man. She came to collect all the halachas of Teda in one book. 
Everything from Hilchas Shabbos to Hilchas Beis Hamikdash to Hilchas Mashiach to Tuma and Tara, whatever you name it, he covers. We call the mechanics of Nigla the Tera. In it, there is obviously there's plenty of neshama there, and he alludes to it or writes to it. Chassidus, on the other hand, is a blueprint for life. It's a life manual. It teaches how the Tera, as I just said, empowers you, character development, and the ability to realize that you are uh, empowerment. Was that I say all three things or not? I don't even remember. Okay. I think, I think the point is clear. Okay. Yeah. And methodology, right. Let's go to point number two. The big picture, which informs all the details of the small picture within Teira. Let me explain what that means. When you open up a Chumash, or for that matter, Teir Shabbat Peh, anything, so everything has a specific area. For example, you start learning Bereshis, so it tells you about creation of the world, what happened each day, then the story of Adam and Chava, Chet Tzadas, Pasha Neach. I mean, I'm not going to go through everything. I'm just giving you examples. There's the Mabel, Deir Afloga, Tower, then the story of Avram Avinu, and the story of Yitzchok, and the story of Yaakov, and their wives, and so on. So Rivka, Rochel, and Leah. Now, when you learn it regularly, even from as children, we learn them piecemeal. You learn a part of, number one, it's our history. Number two, it's... Um, our uh, ancestry. And number three, these great leaders or great people all essentially gave us a direction in life. Avraham Avinu taught us the concept of chesed. He was the pioneer of monotheism. You have uh, Yitzchak teaching the path that he taught, Yaakov, and each generation. So when you teach it, if you were teaching children from the youngest age going older, you're teaching them the story, and then there's the context, the context, which means you start connecting them all. But you don't necessarily see a big picture here. You see a lot of details. Now, if you're a good teacher, you'll try to connect it. You'll say, listen, Avram Avinu, he lived maybe 3,800 years ago, but um, he, he presented a path that we're following till this day. And you put it connected. Seven generations from Avram Avinu would be Moshe Rabbeinu. And you connect the story of Yitzhiya Mitzrayim with Kriya Yamsu Vamat and Teda. But what you're doing is slowly developing a story from the bottom up. What Chassidus does is gives the big picture, which then when you go back to these details, they become illuminated, like someone says, oh, that's the story. Like if someone were to say, what is the story of Teda in general? Before we even begin learning, I think the light was shut off there, by the way, in case you need more light here. Good. Yeah. So if someone said to you, before you start even the first class on Chumash, what do you tell children? I'm, and I'm not right now go, not adapting it necessarily to five-year-olds or ten-year-olds. I'm speaking to you as adults, and each of us has to do it. But what is the central gist? Why are we learning Torah? What is Torah? So most people say it's God's book. He gave this book to us at Matan Torah, and in it lies the divine plan that Hashem wants, what he wants of us. So then you start reading Chumash and start saying, one second, the first pasuk, Bereshit is brought up. Okay, God created heaven and earth. Clear. Let's go to the second pasuk. What does that mean? Even, even pshat is very difficult to understand. And how exactly is that part of the divine blueprint that God gave us? Amat and Teda? Why is that relevant? You know. And then you go on and on, pesukim after pesukim. You'll find verses that are very easy to explain. Of course, v'haftarecha kamecha is a very easy one to explain how that fulfills God's plan. But you start dealing with the details of Esau's grandchildren, or even things like the man fell in the midbar. Okay, it happened, it was a miracle. How do you put that into the context of God's blueprint for us? And we know the Torah is a blueprint. So the most used expression that Rebbe used in all the sikhs, repeated more than any other expression, maybe you can guess what it is, I've already said it, so maybe you know, but um, many people say Hamaiso Iker, which is close. It was said a lot, but there's something even more than that. Teira Meloshen Heira. That Teira is from the word directive or guide. This is used by the Rebbe thousands and thousands of times, sometimes the same Fabrengen ten times. Now, if you ask yourself, one second, how many times does the Rebbe have to repeat that? He said it once, now we know. But because this is the issue, the biggest bottom line that most of us miss. When I say us, I don't mean necessarily in this room. I mean when we learn Teda, you can learn the whole Teda and forget that it's a Hedah, a It's a lesson in life. 
including the second posik, Tehu Vavayu, including things like the man, including even seemingly obscure details about Mitzayda or, or other things. As I said, Vahavta Recha Kamech is the easy one. Lasse's Dokka Mishpat that Avram did Chesed and Dokka Mishpat is also easy. That, that, uh, that people paid a price to do, be, be good people. But there's so many other details. And basically, 99% of the Tehra, if not maybe a little less, 95%, seems, yes, it's all divine. But what do you think is the lesson? And I can tell you a personal experience. I went to the yeshiva system, Chabad Central, Tem Chitmim Labavitch, established by the Rebbe Rashab himself. And you know something? We learned Chumash. It was quite boring. We're in the mood as children now. Sometimes you listen, sometimes you don't. But it was never was brought alive. Yes, certain psukim are very interesting. As a matter of fact, the things that we were most excited about was the Rashis that the teacher chose to skip. <laughs> That's where we went and, and, and then digging, you know? But the other stuff, as I said, I can't say it was a turnoff, but a lot of it was quite boring, and no one even made the statement. I'm not saying everything had to be taught with what is exact Hira, but if, if it was even stated that every verse has a secret to life, let's say, has a method how to address issues. The world was covered in darkness. You know something? You can explain that pretty soon. This is what chassidus do. Darkness, yes, everyone begins their life in darkness. We don't have knowledge. We don't have information. We don't know what's right and what's wrong. And then the Ebrister says, Here is light. Here is clarity. Just a simple thing like that, which is actually a sikha from the Rebbe in Kuti Sikha's Chelik Yud. So what does chassidus do? It takes the whole Teirah and gives you the big picture. Teirah is a hirah. In Medrash it says Teirah is a blueprint for life, which means the Abish to create like an architect, uses a blueprint. So it means everything in life you can find and trace the Teirah. And more than that, like an operator's manual, in the Teirah you'll find directive and answers to what? To the creation that God created. So think of it this way. Here's a machine, and you can explain this to any child. You come home with a new computer, or with a new appliance, or with a toy, whatever it is. Now, how do you know how to use it? How do you know how not to destroy it? It always comes with an operator's manual. It says, make sure to take care of it, do this, don't do that, don't put it in water, clean it, here's how you use it, change the batteries, whatever. The is the, is the is the engineer of existence, created all of existence, including us. We're the machines. The world is one big machine, or organism, or whatever term you use, and he gave us an operator's manual of what makes it work better, and what makes it, what damages it. And every mitzvah, mitzvah sesa, la'ovda, or l'shamra, when Adam and Chava are told, la'ovda means, here's what you do to make the world work better, and l'shamra, protect, is l'shase, what to avoid, not to be destructive. Everyone can understand that. And when you speak in that, that this language, again, is not my words. These are words from Sikhs and from my modem. When they speak, what is teira? That's how they describe it. And in Tanya as well. However, again, remember, Chassidus is also couched within Lushenus of Chazal and a lot of deep ideas of Kabbalah. So sometimes it's hard to glean out and glean and take out of it the simple message. But it's right there. And once you have the big picture, what Teira is, then you start seeing how every detail will fit in. I'm right now, I teach every morning a class in Ayin Beis. So Ayin Beis is like the magnum opus of all Chassidus of Chassidus, like you're talking about thousands of pages of the Rebbe Rashab. And, uh, the, collecting together all the ideas of Chassidus. And we happen to be learning about man. That's why I mentioned it. The man, Lechem and Hashemayim. You know, it's one of these things that happened that the Ebeshter, when the Eden were in Midbar, there was, a Midbar doesn't have food. So how did he feed the Eden? Every morning, the dew would fall and it had upon it some of this magical food called man, Lechem and Hashemayim. And that's how they sustain themselves. I always was bothered by simple questions. If God's already making miracles, why doesn't he just give them bread? What does he have to do this whole thing from Shemayim? And you know what? You make even a bigger miracle. Who says they have to eat for 40 years? You're already doing miracles. Make it easy. Why do they have to deal with it? And you never really get an answer. You read the man, a miracle, Hashem did it. Why? Kriyas Yamsuf. You know, to get to Israel from Egypt, you don't need to go through any water. So how did they end up being by water and they couldn't pass without having the water part? So you probably know this. It was, the Abraham took them on a detour. He took them to a place where they would be stuck. Now, why would they to do such a thing? In order to do a miracle, they could have gone without a miracle. So you may have an answer, and there's answers in Nigla and this, but Siddhis will come and explain it from the top, that this wasn't just happened to be, 
it all had part of the bigger purpose. Why is there a man? Just to give you an example. It's not another detail that happened to the Jews. The small picture, the big picture. Man is a, he want, Hashem wanted to infuse in the Eden a sense that all food comes from a greater place, from heaven. That when they would go into Eretz Neshavis, into Israel, and they would do plant and, and uh, we, uh, uh, grain and have bread from earth, they would know even bread from earth really originated from heaven. They should never forget that this material world is sustained from a higher place. I'm giving a simple explanation. This in Ayin Beza, it's a lot deeper than that. But basically saying that, the, that we have a connection to the highest transcendent levels. So to sum up, what Chassidus does, it gives you the big picture. And it could be explained to children, to adults. Obviously, everyone in their terms. A bigger picture means what's the overall overarching uh, or undercurrent of Teda. And then whatever detail you're dealing with is then completely enriched by the big picture. As we all know, when you have a big picture, the small picture starts making sense. It's like you get the bird's eye view of it all. So that's item number two that uh, is directly a type of thing that Chassidus contributes. Okay, number three. So this is called roots versus symptoms, preventive medicine versus remedial medicine. Okay. You'll see a lot of R's because I was working with the R's, you know. Um, so you, you probably, I, I even saw, I think, for this co conference, they gave out a letter that was just recently discovered from 1970, 86, 87. And the Rebbe speaks about it very openly, and it's, but it's in many places. The difference between remedial or therapeutic medicine, he calls it, symptomatic, and preventive medicine. Now, this isn't a small matter. This is fundamental. So when you address a problem, you can address it based on the symptoms. Someone has a headache. You get an aspirin or, a, or an Advil or whatever it is that they use today. You have a little cut, God forbid. You put on a Band-Aid. These are remedial um, interventions. They solve the problem for the moment. And frankly, if it's a superficial wound or superficial pain, you can get rid of it. And that's it. Fight it. However, if it's a deeper issue, we know remedial is not going to last. You may need it for the short term just to stop the bleeding or just to get rid of the pain and headache, but there may be a deeper rooted issue. God forbid. We all hope not. Even deeper than rooted, so when you want it, what do you have to do then? You have to then get to the root. You have to figure out what's the cause. Why is this person keeps bleeding? Why is this person constantly feeling pain? So you can get rid of the symptoms and not really resolve, resolve the issue. But then there's something even deeper. We'll call it prevent, preventive medicine. That you don't even have to deal. You've already dealt with the root from the outset. You don't have to wait till there's a problem and then either solve it with symptomatic means or with, with, uh, with uh, root means. You prevent it in the first place. You educate or you train someone in a way that they behave that never happens in the first place. Simple examples that you have in daily life, brush your teeth properly with fluoride, etc., etc., you will prevent cavities. Doesn't always mean a guarantee, but it definitely adds to lower the risk. Eat the right foods. Don't smoke. I mean, I can go on and on. Create certain environmental and dietary and hygiene and exercises in a regular way from a young age so that automatically will prevent a lot of problems that come later. Well, let's talk psychological now, where it gets much more complicated. Psychological also, there are remedial approaches and there are root approaches. Person's feeling down, they're depressed or sad, or something else is not motivating them, they don't feel something. So when you're a sensitive parent or educator, you notice it. Now it could be something symptomatic, which means something maybe just happened and you just, you get over it, or Unfortunately, it can sometimes mean there's an indication of something deeper going on. You know, they say today, as soon as you see a child, some type of change in behavior, like they don't eat, don't eat they're not sleeping, or waking up early, you don't ignore such things because it's usually a sign of something. Now, it could be sometimes it's a short-term thing and you just can resolve it, but sometimes something else has happened. And if you're sensitive, as I said, you catch it. That is dealing with the symptoms or dealing with the root. But then there's a whole approach of a preventive approach. How, what, what does it take to educate a child in a healthy way that will be the best approach to minimize the risks of life? We all will deal with the challenges of life. That we cannot avoid. There are things that happen that are not in our control. Whether well, losses, death, God forbid, disease. You know, the things that we, that we can't do anything about. But 
how you cope with them, that we can do a lot about. So what would be, if someone were to say, what would be the key ingredients to give your child or student the best fighting chance to deal whatever will come their way? Again, we can't predict what will come, but you can be prepared for what will come. Now, if you ask an average from Jew about this, Torah and Mitzvahs, many will say, do Torah and Mitzvahs. The Hebrews to said, learn Torah and keep Mitzvahs and Davin, and that will protect us. In Telechu, follow the Torah, and the Hebrews will take care of us. But first of all, we see that doesn't always work. Second of all, more importantly, are we actually doing Torah and Mitzvahs correctly? Who says you're doing it right? Just because you feel I'm going to do the Torah the way you're doing it. I, I've, I've known many dysfunctional people who are very firm people. As a matter of fact, it's sad to say this, but I can tell you that a dysfunctional person who's from is usually more problematic than a dysfunctional person that's not from, because they dress it up in the from kite. And the religion itself can be an addiction. And they think my religion is protecting me. And they don't even look at it. They say, what do you mean? I'm doing everything right. I'm eating kosher, tars, mishpocha, kasher, Shabbos, and everything. So what's the problem? And they think that because they're doing all that, they don't have to address personality issues, conflicts, and so on. I've seen this many, many times. You know, a couple that came to see me, and they were having shalom bias issues. They come from two different countries. So besides everything else, they had cultural differences. And they said, they told me something very interesting. They said, look, you know, we both became from later in life. They met before, after they were both from already. And, um, and we thought, hey, you know, we're doing, all of our tell us, be from Eden, and everything will resolve itself. So they keep Shabbos and Kashrus and their Magdaik, and every time they have Shalom Bayis issues, they add more mitzvahs and more Hidurim. They say it's not helping. So I pointed out to them something which I heard once from Amashpia, which I thought was a very good insight. There's tshuva in Maisa. You can do tshuva in actions. God forbid you once didn't eat kosher, now you eat kosher. You didn't keep Shabbos, now you keep Shabbos. You didn't keep Pesach, now you keep Pesach. So good, you learn what has to be done. But then there's a tshuva in personality. Just because you became a Shomer Shabbos does not mean your personality changed. You may still be a very judgmental person. You may still be a very stingy person. You may be you're still your parents are your parents, and how they dealt with uh, challenges is what you'll do. If your mother yelled and had a tantrum every time there was a crisis, most likely you'll do the same. Just because you started keeping Shabbos, that doesn't mean that your personality changed. So I told them, now you have the real work. The real Baal Shuva work is you did Shuva in Mice, and now you have to become like the rest of us, which is the hardest work, is to work on your personality. And that's not, Shuva doesn't change. That's Tzaddikim as well, or I should say Bali Aveda and Bali Shuva have that same issue. It's a better way, because Tzaddikim, we know, it's like someone once at a table said, I'm looking for a Shidduch. So someone suggested, they said, I don't want a Baal Shuva. So he said, well, the only other option is a Bali Aveda, you know? <laughs> The thing about Shuvah or a Tzaddik, especially a Tzaddik from Tanya, you're not finding that so fast. Halavaya Benini, you know. But the point I'm making here is that what Chassidus does is addresses this issue, not just that you do technically Torah Mitzvahs, that you also understand the spirit of Torah Mitzvahs. You can keep Shabbos and not be a Shabbos Dika person. You can, be, you can eat kosher and not be a kosher person. What I mean by that, kosher in behavior, in menschlichkeit, and so on. So just because you do it doesn't mean you have become it. Now, that doesn't mean not to do it, but it means action without the nisham of it, which is the critical element in this point that I'm talking about, which is going back to, I'm going to talk about in the next item as well. Let me just see. Yeah, the root versus symptoms, preventive. So what's preventive? Preventive is essentially teaching children from the outset, not waiting for a problem. Now, I'll just give a few examples because this really requires a lot more elaboration. What's our time schedule? Why? Why is it? No, fine. Uh, around how much more? Half hour? 20 minutes? What? Oh, okay, good. I want to make sure I'm covering everything. Uh, I'm going to leave room for time for questions as well, but I'll let me finish first the five points. So, in this context, so the question is okay, so what are some tips or some approaches Chsidis would offer us? in preventive medicine, so to speak. So what can you do? What can you do for, nurture, for educating a child in the right way that it would be minimizing the risks that have, give them a much more fighting chance? Basically, giving them the full set and arsenal of, schools, of skill sets and tools that they need to deal with whatever will come their way. Remember, we spoke about empowerment in item one. And we talked about 
uh, methodology and uh, character development. So this, in a way, connects to that because that's what you're. So what would be a few principles? So first of all, if Tanya was translated into simple English as a type of, I don't want to call it preventive medicine, but a type of book that gives us the guidelines how to deal with life, that would be, of course, a tremendous tool in what we're talking about here. No one, I don't think, has ever really done that, taking Tanya and turned it into, let's say, a manual for educators, how to educate our children based on these principles, because it would have to be an adaptation, obviously, because Tanya itself is so dense and has so much information. Something has been done? Okay. No, I've seen that, but that's not education necessary. That's just basically taking the principles. Yeah, there, that has been done by quite a few. They've taken Tanya and turned it into principles. I'm talking about turning it into a guide that you can follow and say, follow this and you'll have the healthiest possible child. That's what I meant, more like an educating terms. I don't think that was done. Um, so, I mean, work has been done, I'm sure. It was, and my point here is not, if, the, if it's been done, great. I stand corrected. I'm not looking to make a point on this. I'm just saying I haven't seen it, that's all. Um, so here, here's a few key points. I'm, I'm going to use Takatanya and a few other places. So one point, for example, the mere fact that, that the Tanya establishes that a person, as I said, has two voices, two neshamas, nefoshes, nefshukis and nefeshabamis. So I know this has been done because I myself have heard it, but I'm using this even though many of you probably have used it and maybe will use it. You can teach this to even the youngest child who has some intelligence. It means the basic rules of discipline that every time you're in the classroom with other kids, are you going to take a toy away from them? Are you going to behave in a way that's uh, kind and sensitive? Or are you going to behave in a narcissistic and selfish way? Those are really the two voices that you will have the rest of your entire life. So besides teaching children the basics that you have to be a mensch and you have to know how to do that, which any good educator is going to do, but it's actually even deeper than that. It's your whole personality, your whole life you're going to have these two voices. Whether you're five years old or whether you're 25 years old or you're 55 or 100. These are the two, way, the two voices, the two souls that each of us have in this life. And even knowing that is already empowering. Because you know, next time that something comes up that's like challenging, you can say to yourself, here, here we have my voice. I remember when I was a kid in yeshiva, a kid I was like, you know, teenager, young teenager, 14, 15. So there's a guy who would always come late in the morning. And I remember the mashgiach called him over and said, why are you always coming late? So he says, I'm tired. I, I can't get up out of bed. So the mashgiach told him this lesson. He said to him, look, next time you wake up in the morning and you know you see the, the alarm clock, you know it's time to go to yeshiva and you want to stay in bed. Remember, there's two souls at work here. One soul is telling you to stay in bed and just and it's languish. The other soul is telling you it's time to go to school. So no, you have a battle. And simply tell the animal soul that wants you to stay, hey, too bad, we got to go to school. And that's it. So OK, that worked. We'll take questions at the end, OK? Um, I, I, so, that, so that worked. The guy started coming pretty much on time every day. Then, of course, a few weeks passed, and he lapses back to his old behavior. And I remember I went to Yeshiva with him. We came together on the bus from uh, Crown Heights to Ocean Parkway. And we come in, and he's, he came, and I came earlier. He came, he's at like 10.30 or something, like an hour and a half late. So the teacher, the mashgiach, says to him, so what happened? What happened? Someone's phone? Okay, so the Mashgir says, what happened? He says, you predicted everything perfectly. I woke up 7 o'clock in the morning, and the two souls started fighting. This one said, stay in bed, and this one says, go to school. And it took an hour and a half for the divine soul to win. <laughs> That's what he told them. Okay, so there you go. The point I'm making here is that sometimes, especially psychologically, when you know the dynamics at work, it's very empowering. Even if you sometimes fail and weak, but at least you know it's not just stamaze, you know, you want to do something, you don't want to do something. Just to know. So the mere fact, like, knowing the problem is half the cure. Knowing that you have two voices. Knowing that even before you are faced with a challenge, you will have challenges like this all the time. Should you join a machlekes and, and Lashon Hara, or should you not? Should you be giving? Should you be taking? I mean, you can, the list goes on. Just knowing that is very, very empowering. And I can tell you a lot of therapy, secular therapy, 
uses this method a lot because it like clarifies. So next time, for example, a person who's dealing with certain addictions or dealing with other cravings or temptations and so on, the mere fact that you can say, you know what, I could, be, I could prepare and anticipate this may happen in a certain circumstance gives you strength. Do you always resolve it? No. But that's an example. So teaching our children certain things that how we tick, that we have a nefesh alikis, nefesh abamis, and the language of the teri, it's a tevi, it's a hara, whatever language you use, is itself very powering. Another thing, and this is not an order of priority. Another thing, we all know this is obvious, but I'll say it anyway, the nurturing. We know today, there's no question, that the single biggest factor that, that can prevent problems in life, psychological, emotional, and relationship issues, intimate issues, is how, how, how well nurtured you are and loved unconditionally as a child. And vice versa. The lack of nurturing is one of the greatest indicators that there's going to be challenges. Now, this is not just a, uh, a, a magic pill, magic button. We know people have grown up in very difficult circumstances, and they have achieved re uh, levels of refinement that are amazing. And there are people who have very nurturing environments and have taken it for granted and became miserable people. So this is not a guarantee in the sense of uh, exact. But if you talk about maximizing uh, the potential and minimizing risks, that nurturing, which is spoken about so much, but you only see it by people who actually do it. It's not done as much as we speak about it, which is the attention that we give our children in the point of focusing on their uniqueness, not just that they're part of a herd or a group or even the rest of the children in your family or school or class. The idea of nurturing in the context of seeing, being sensitive when you see that they have some type of challenge, constant validation, and definitely not critique and judgment that demoralizes them, demoralizing one of the worst possible things you can do to a soul. The al Tareb even says in chapter 26 in Tanya, he says that, that's exactly his litmus test. How do you know when you feel bad about something, that it's healthy or not healthy? So if it leads to be de being demoralized and you feel weak, and you feel not motivated, you know it's coming from the Eight Sahara. Even if it's correct critique, because it's like he says, it weakens you, and you have no resolve to do anything about it. You can't wrestle because you feel completely demoralized. If, on the other hand, it's something that you feel motivated by, let's say you feel you did something wrong, but you feel motivated now to do better, then you know it's coming from a good place, because the result is action, not paralysis. So that idea of creating children that even if there's something to criticize, something to challenge, but it's never through demoralizing and through judgment and critique that hurts their self-confidence. Because you undermine that, then as they grow older, they will constantly second-guess themselves. When decisions have to be made, they'll always have that second, that possibility, maybe something is, uh, maybe I'm not right, and, and undermine self-esteem. Now, you'll say, where is this in Chassidus? I just showed you in Peter Chavav, but there's a lot, a lot of places. I would say it's basically, really, uh, between the lines of almost any mimer is about this. You were created in a divine image. You have, therefore, a unique mission. Hashem has given you all the keiches you need to do it. And as a parent or an educator, all you are is a gardener to make sure that the weeds are weeded and, this, and the flower blossoms. So a parent and educator that reinforces this message on a daily basis and very specific way, I'll suggest, for example, when you say moida'ani with your children, or with your students, or biyot chav kedruchi, and you say, in addition to what the, the tefillah itself, the actual translation, in addition to saying, I love you, you also say, God sent you as a, a gift to this world, and I feel blessed to be able to help you actualize and become who you should become, to become a true shliach, or shlucha, of the Rebbe, of Hashem, in this world. I made the suggestion actually a few years ago in an email, and I can tell you many parents wrote to me how it changed literally the way they communicate with their children, and the way their children started asking, what does that mean? What means a mission? Tell me more. And it became conversation. I'm just giving examples because, as I said, this is not a thorough uh, the workshop here on every possible thing Siddhis gives us. I'm really speaking about general principles and just some examples. So you're talking about preventive medicine? This is what it is. I have a feeling, without even a question in my mind, that when the Rebbe established Sivas Hashem in 1980, in 81, in addition to all the other good benefits that it has, was the Rebbe saw a crisis in education, a crisis in dealing with children, in a world where parents are two, two jobs, don't have the time. And the Rebbe, in a sense, took children under his own um, uh, arm 
to give them an additional reinforcement, spoke to them, empowered them, Sikhs, hundreds of Sikhs, danced with them, Simchas Teda, Lag Beimah Parade. It wasn't just a Chinuch effort. It was actually to shape them. And children were shaped by this. They never forget this, the attention the Rebbe gave. The Rebbe was a busy man. And it reminds me back to Yud Beis Thomas, Yud Gimel Thomas, the Rebbe once said, Friedrich Rebbe was the Mesiris Nefesh for Teneke Shal Beis Rabon, education of young children. The Rebbe once said that the Friedrich Rebbe, who could have been busy with the biggest minds in the world and the biggest evdim in the world in teaching chsidus, compromised all of that to teach olive bays to a child that no, has no Jewish education in America. That's the Mesiris Nefesh. So you take a Moshe Rabbeinu of the highest level, instead of working with the greatest scholars, it went down to basically create a Merkus Lignone Chinuch, Chinuch, teach Aleph to a child, Beis, the love for God. What did the Baal Shem Tev do? It's amazing when you think about it. He wasn't even a school teacher. He was a bus driver, equivalent of today. There was no buses then. He walked children to school. He wasn't even the teacher. You could think that alone is pretty much, I mean, a person on that caliber spending time with kindergarten children also is quite a serious nefesh. But he wouldn't even do that. He walked them to school to be able to talk to them about Hashem. Baruch Hashem, make a bracha, how's your day? The Baal Shem Tev, that's how he began his so-called career. Okay? So you see from this, and the Rebbe, Tzivus Hashem was essentially in that same spirit. He saw the need, and as much as you do, there could always be more. So it's seeing a child, as the Rebbe would say in so many Fabrengans, as a gift from God, a flower. This isn't Stam a child. It's not mentioning names, even though everyone knows who they are because they're, they publicize it. It was a father, a shliach, who unfortunately would hit his children physically. And he couldn't control himself. And he wrote to the Rebbe, what should he do? And the Rebbe says to him, next time you even think of lifting your arm to a child, say to yourself, it's not your child. It's Hashem's child. It's God's child. What right do you have to touch God's creation? I never asked him if it worked or not, but uh, that's what the Rebbe said. I hope it worked. But you see how the Rebbe looks at it. Children don't belong to parents. They don't belong to people altogether. They're God's children. For some crazy reason, God entrusted them with mortal, flawed human beings, parents, and that's it. We're now the caretakers, whether we like it or not. But the Rebbe's educating. This is my siyadi lihispoir. People ask me, where did I get the line in Toward a Meaningful Life in the chapter on birth? Birth is God saying, you matter. Well, lately it's been rephrased. Birth is God saying that the world could not exist without you, whatever. So I wrote it in English. I got it, you know where? From Sichas, from the Rebbe, to children. In many Tzivas Hashem Sichas, the Rebbe would quote the Pasuk. We say it's one of the yud based Pesukim. Va'amach kulim tzadikim, right? And then it says, Neitzer matoi, maisi yodil ispoir. You're my handiwork that I am proud of. And I remember a number of times the Rebbe would speak and say, each one of you was chosen by the Eberster and, and you have absolute indispensable, I'm translating from the Yiddish, indispensable shlichus to fulfill. And the Eberster is standing near you and watching you and you matter. That was what the Rebbe was giving value that we live in a world of seven and a half billion people. In a shtetl, this was maybe not an issue. In a shtetl, you knew a hundred people from when you were born till you died and that was it. Today we live in a global village. It's very easy in this depersonalized world to forget about the human the dignity, the dignity of a soul. And the Rebbe made that very clear, even with little children. These are examples of what's called preventive, how you educate a child at the outset. Because when you have that type of self-value, you can rest assured that child will grow up with a lot more um, tools to deal with challenges. Because not every time you're criticized will you be shaken by it. You have a more un a type of unwavering confidence in yourself. Obviously, we'll all go through challenges, but you're empowered as opposed to someone who never had that validation, is not given that sense, then, they, then every time something happens, yeah, they could be thrown and it's very complicated and very difficult. Trust issues, intimacy issues, in relationships, all will suffer when a person is second-guessing themselves and doesn't have that inner self-esteem. So you could say all the chassidus really teaches that. Hashem created you in the divine image and created a whole seder ishtalshalus just for you. So you should be able to have a relationship with him. That's a pretty big vote of confidence, wouldn't you just say? And when you learn Chassidus, you see it openly. Chumash, you also can see it, but in Chumash, you can get distracted. In certain places, the Pasuk says it. The created the human being in the divine image. 
he, get, he went all the way out of his way to take the Eden out of Mitzrayim, not in Teda, but when you look at then you look in Chumash and you realize that's the, like I said, the big picture informs the small picture. So I can give some more examples, but I think that will suffice for now. Let's go to the next item. Next item is what? Is um, relevance. Okay. The truth is, a lot of what I've said is pretty clear what relevance is. I mentioned before, Teda, Melosh, and Heira. That simply means relevance. So any detail in Teda you read, even things that seem completely irrelevant today. You know, someone will say, Mitzeda doesn't exist today. All the laws of Beis HaMikdash, the whole, almost Sefer Vayikra. Most of Sefer Vayikra, tell me, what is its relevance today? With Achsidis, you have no answer. You just say, you know what, we're reading about the Karbonis, and Kol HaEsek B'Teir Sa'elo, everyone who learns about Karbonis will be Zeicha that will ultimately bring back the Beis HaMikdash HaShlishi. That's the most you'll hear. But Achsidis comes and takes every detail of Karbonis and Tuma and Tare and things that even seem to be completely not physically existent today and gives us the spiritual message and its lesson, the Hira B'chaim. So when I was teaching Tanya many years ago in Beis Rifka High School, 12th 12 graders, and since I had access to the Rebbe because I worked in the Sikhs, so I asked the Rebbe whether you can translate the words that Sharblat of Tanya says that the, the Sefer is miyusid awat and the Pasuk kikor ve'lecha adover me'ed b'fichu b'lvav chalasesei Levayet hetev, echu karav meid, badera charucha ktsara, bezes shashem is barach. The Alter Rebbe himself wrote those words on the paid cover page of Tanya, which is a rarity. You don't usually get the author writing the cover page. So he gave the whole purpose of Tanya. The question is, what does the word karav mean? Moshe Rabbeinu said it to the Eden. What does the word karav mean? So everyone translates karav as close. Karav, this thing is close to you. Now, what does close mean? Physical proximity. So look, you're, you're, you're in a place, let's say, you're sitting right near Aron Kedish or near Chumash, physically close. Is that what Karav Elecha means, that you're close to it? Obviously, that's not the right translation. So I asked the Rebbe whether you can translate Karav as the word relevant, that it's relevant to you. So in other words, it's close in spirit to you. It's not necessarily the physical closeness. And the Rebbe circled and made a check, yes. So I have like a certain endorsement, the word relevant. Now you take relevant and now apply that to the whole Tanya. Then you understand the whole thing. Moshe Rabbeinu said in the last days of his life that this thing called Teir Mitzvah will be not Rechekehi, it's not distant, Leib he not in heaven, Leib Me'ever Le'yam, not across any wide sea. Kikarev Elecha. It's relevant to you. It's not abstract. It's not of a different time and age, ancient, archaic. It's from here and now. Relevant to your life. But the Meshach never said how. He only made the statement that it is. Comes the Alter Rebbe and says, I'll write a whole sefer called Tanya to teach us how it's karav lecha, how it's relevant. And by learning chassidus, basically, of course, starting with Tanya Teresh HaBiksav, the written law, the certain, the written the Teresh HaBiksav of chassidus, it teaches you exactly eichu karav ma'id, how it is close to us, how it's relevant to us. So basically, this means that every line, every word in Teda, and of course, every line and word in Chassidus is relevant. I saw recently a Yechidus from the Rebbe, uh, of Rabbi David Raskin. It's a very early Yechidus in the summer of Tavshin Yud. That would be the summer of 1950. So this is like months after Yud Shvat, and the Rebbe did not assume leadership yet officially. So it's a, uh, and, and the Yechidus is an interesting thing. I, I want to mention two things from there. One, he asked the Rebbe, what, you learn chassidus, you don't feel it affects you. What should you do? And number two, and the, uh, so the Rebbe answered on that one. He gave an example I never saw anywhere else. The Rebbe said that's like walking in the street on a sunny day and your eyes are closed. So even though the sun is affecting you, you don't see it. So chassidus is affecting you no matter what. question is if you recognize it or not. That was the Rebbe's answer. And then the second thing the Rebbe said, how to learn a mimer chassidus. And the Rebbe said every word, every, the Rebbe said actually every chapter. When you finish a chapter, you have to always ask, what does it mean for me? Not besides what the mimer tells you it means. What does it mean? And the Rebbe gave an example because they were talking about a certain mimer. You're learning about the mile of Limudat Teda. So Chassidus talks, the Limudat Teda, connecting with, uh, like he says in Tanya, that uh, connect Chachmosh Yishal Kodesh Baruch Hu, 
you're connecting with God's mind, your mind is connecting to God's mind, and all the different things about Teda. So fine, that's a beautiful idea. The Rebbe says, what's the Hira? That tomorrow morning you're going to add a shear in learning Teda, or going to learn more Teda than you did today. The Maimah doesn't say at the end, go learn more Teda. But you don't let an idea in Chassidus just remain an idea. You have to say, what am I going to do about it? How am I going to apply it? And then the Rebbe gives an interesting example. He says, example is, when you want to pierce a garment, you want to sew a garment, what do you need? You need a needle. What's a needle? A needle is very thin, but it makes it pierces. The Rebbe said, the mimer itself is the content. That's like the finger, a thick thing. You don't use a thick thing to pierce a garment. The bechain, the lesson, and the relevant lesson in your life, that's the needle. It may be very small, because it's not like, the whole depth of the mimer, but you know what it does? It drives the point home. It pierces the soul. That's the Rebbe's Moshal. So I was thinking about it, because obviously I deal with this a lot. You know, you teach an idea, and then you want to have like a takeaway message. And this is true whether it's children or adults. What's the takeaway message? It has to be a piercing message, that they will say, you know what, I'm motivated to go do it. And you can give a whole talk and teach a whole subject, and if a person is not motivated to act, frankly, I would consider that for myself a failure. It means all my talk was very nice, but I couldn't get them to do an action. I didn't pierce them. Or the words, words that come from the heart, enter the heart. Which means, you learn a beautiful idea, it could be in Chumash, it could be in Shonarach, it could be in history, whatever it may be. It could be in Chassidus. And you were able to take away a takeaway personal message where a person relates to it. That they say, you know what, that's something I'm motivated to do because it relates to me and my personal life. That changes the whole picture. Because then what they've done is you've taken an idea and you said it's negated to me. In Chassidus, there's a concept that we say something is good and then you say it's good for me. Many of us like things. I'm sorry, many of us appreciate certain things as good. But you don't apply it to yourself always and say it's good for me. So Tev Li is the goal. That's not just a good idea, but it's actually good for me. So we all like, you read about Avram Avinu, you read about Moshe Rabbeinu, they were great heroes. But then you ask, okay, and what does it mean to me? How does that motivate me? So that challenge of taking that last step of making it relevant and bringing a personally, driving the point home is the key. The truth is, the whole world of marketing is based on that. That you can talk from today till tomorrow if you don't get the person to make a move and buy the product, even if it's a shmata, you weren't successful. So the whole thing is all to lead up to a person to actually act. So we can definitely apply that to us, but the key thing is the action. But action will be motivated when there's relevance. And I can tell you without question, in my own experience, that relevance is the hardest thing of all. Or I would say the hardest, the most challenging. Because whether it's not, whether it's not relevant to this group here, whether it's Jews, most Jews today were assimilated and don't relate to Yiddishkeit, the biggest issue is they don't find it relevant. You know, a Pesach Seder, I'll go because my grandfather's going to have a heart attack if I don't show up. Or I'll go because I'll guilt or my parents or whatever. But say, what's relevant? Yom Kippur is relevant to me. Shabbos is relevant. On the other hand, teach them relevance, and then you got them. Because everyone wants to do things that are relevant. If a person has a choice, I can go to the beach, or go have some fun, that's relevant to me. And what you're offering is just a burden. Of course they're not going to do. They may do it out of guilt. You may convince them one time. Now, even in our own world, meaning even in the Shema Teda Mitzvah's world, you could do Teda Mitzvah's and also it may not be relevant. Many people do it culturally. You grew up with it. It's comfortable. Relevance requires chassidus to teach you why is this personally relevant to me. You ask most people, why are you from? If they're really honest, they'll say, that's what I grew up with. What other option do I really have? I know it sounds like a very simple response, but it's a very true one. Many people will not say it because their pride will not there. Many will say, what do you mean? It's what God wants. I thought it through. I looked at all my options. It seems like the best one. Okay. I don't think that's the case in most people's case. There are people that are that way, but in most cases it's not that way. And that means because it's not relevant. So you could understand when the Alter Rebbe wrote Tanya, Korve Lecha, he was referring to all Eden because everyone can use a good dose of relevance. You know, go to a shul on Shabbos, any shul, and what do you hear by Kriya Satera? The Balkhead is reading, and then have, you know, the different people in Shul feel it's their mission to correct every mispronunciation. 
it frankly always bothered me as a child. And I remember once asking my father, I was like maybe six years old, I said, what is this correcting? What, like, what difference does it make? He pronounced it, didn't pronounce it. So someone overheard me asking my father, and he says, this guy is going to be a troublemaker. You know? <laughs> what do you mean, what's the difference? The holy words of God. You have to say it exactly. So I said, I understand. But, you know, like, to me, then I saw the person is also doesn't really treat people so nicely. So maybe they're yelling at the guy mispronouncing because they like to yell at people, and here they just happen to dress it up in the garments of Krisatera. So someone will say, why is he not so passionate about teaching everybody that comes into shul to understand the importance of the message of the Kriya? Why is it more important to him, the pronunciation? If someone will ask him, what's the lesson? Why should I even listen to the Tayyid in the first place? The guy will yell at him. To me, that was my own little subtle way I recognized where there's a dissonance, a disconnect between people who are frum in actions, but love Dafka frum in uh, their heart and soul. So you could do that, and we have a lot of that. So relevance... Is, relevant, is, good, is relevant for everyone. Meaning the idea of bringing the point and saying, why is it relevant to you? You know, you want to know every diuk of why you pronounce the Kriya Satera? Tell me, what was the message in this week's Pasha for us in our personal lives? And if a person starts laughing and say, that's not relevant, it's only important to know the pronunciation, you tell me what the message from that is. You know, it means you're focusing, I'm not saying pronunciation should be perfect, I'm not denying that. But only focus on that and you forgot about the personal lesson you know, it reminds me of the guy that, that uh, it's a sad story. Uh, someone told a guest in the house, Friday night dinner, Friday night Shabbos meal. And um, his wife, the, the host, had a bunch of guests. And the host's wife forgot to, um, forgot to cover, bring the, 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 the challah cover, to cover the challah. And he began to berate her in front of people, insulting and humiliating her. Like, you know, showing that she's inept and so on. You know, first of all, why don't you go yourself and get the cover? Was your wife your slave? That's not, we'll get, we, won't, we won't even go into that. But there was one of the guests there who didn't realize was actually knew something or two about Yiddishkeit. And the guest says to this host, in the middle of the meal, he says, you know, I noticed that uh, you were upset about the fact that the challah wasn't covered. So he says, why did it bother you so much? So he says, it's important, the challah, when you make kiddush, you, you don't want to embarrass the bread, so you cover the challah. You don't embarrass the bread. So the guy, that's what he was leading up to, he says to him, and what about embarrassing your wife? Is that allowed? The challah can't be embarrassed, but the wife can be embarrassed. You understand? So he's very much focused on the, on the challah being not humiliated. You know? But he forgot that there's a human being and maybe a bigger mitzvah, because the covering a challah is maybe a minig or maybe somewhere based on a din. And humiliating a person, especially your wife, is, even, is much bigger than that. That's a perfect example of the dissonance. I can give you hundreds of others that are far more nightmarish. These are more humorous ones. Actually, not so humorous, this last one. You know, I had myself, I remember sitting at a Seder table, a little kid, we used to go to my grandparents. and We loved going, and I had my uncle, who was a little older than I, and we're sitting, the first cup of wine, and you're supposed to lean, right? Mesubim. And I didn't lean far enough for his taste. So he says to me, you have to lean. And he's like, starts pushing me. I said, why do you have to lean? He says, cheres, dere cheres. It means, you know, that's how you behave if you're a free person. He starts banging my head and says to me, lean, lean more, lean more. You got to be free, you got to be free. Basically, he's punching me. He's like putting me in prison to be free. So, truth be told, I did not need therapy. I wasn't traumatized. It was, it was a joke. Till this day, I laugh about it. because I knew him. It didn't, uh, you know. And I uh, thank God I was immunized from such um, uh, aggression. But the point I'm making here is that there's a lot of things that are very um, inconsistent. Chassidus actually has an example for it. In the Maimorim, actually that Maimor I mentioned, Kibla Yehudim, Tafresh Pezai, and the Friedrich Rebbe brings. You ever hear the expression, Ganve Apumach Tarte Karya? That it says a Ganif, before he goes to steal, he davens to Hashem to help him steal. So, of course, it sounds like insanity. It's one thing you want to ignore God, deny God, fine. God said, Le Signev, don't steal. So you're going to the person who told the God that told you not to steal and say, Why don't you help me? Does that make sense? Like going to the policeman, I need you to help me rob the bank. Doesn't make any sense. So Chsidis says, because Amuna could be makif. Amuna could be detached. What we call dissonance. It's detached. He really believes. That's why he's davening. But he forgot to personalize it. There's a God. He's praying to God to help him succeed. And he forgot to think. One second, you're doing something exactly opposite of what your amunah dictates. Because it's very easy to live in a world where you can be very frum and forget to be a mensch. 
and very from and forget, as I said, you could eat kosher and not be kosher. You could keep Shabbos and not be Shabbos dick. You know? And that's a big part of what Chassidus teaches, that type of um, relevance. And finally, number five in this uh, distillation, empathy, emotional intelligence, and health. As I said, some of what I already spoke about probably addresses this as well, but let me spell it out. This, I can, again, testify personal experience. I hope it's more better by, by the women than by the men. But I can tell you, many of my colleagues and many men went through the system, the yeshiva system, and are brilliant scholars, book smart, but frankly, when it comes to emotional intelligence, they're imbeciles, immature. Another form of dissonance. And I, I was always bothered by it, per se, but then when I started realizing that chassidus, is it possible to learn chassidus and be emotionally immature, to understand chassidus? And you know what? There are people who really know chassidus. They really know what it says in the book, and they're emotionally immature. So then something I read that finally answered the question. In Tov Shinalef, the Friedrich Rebbe has a sikh, a Pesach, where he tells the story that when the Alter Rebbe wrote Tanya, the first Tanya came out in Tov Kuf Nun Zayin. So after a year of studying it, Chassidim, and then two years, I think he says, then they came to the Alter Rebbe, and they said, we don't understand Tanya. Okay, welcome to the club. Great, not only the Chassidim are today, they, they didn't understand it then. And the Alter Rebbe says to them, because you only have half a thing. And a half a thing, you can't understand the whole picture without only half the story. What's to have the story? What's the other half? He says, Nigina, song. That's what Alter Rebbe says. You can look it up. Sefer HaSichas, Tov Shin Aleph. I think of the first or second night of Pesach. Nigina. And when you have Nigina, the second half, you'll understand Tanya. So I said, one second here. I never heard this in my life before. I mean, I just read it a few years ago. And I mean, I sensed a certain truth to it, but I never saw it myself. And I realized, what's Nagina? What does Alter Rebbe mean? That you should hum a song when you're learning Tanya? It's not exactly what he's saying. He means, Nagina means it touches you emotionally. What is Nagina? Kulmus Halev, the quill of the heart. Ideas, when you see ideas, it touches your mind, it stimulates the mind. It could touch your heart, but it could also not. A Nigin is a whole different story. When you sing a Nigin, what happens? It transports you to another time and place. It can bring you to tears, to laughter. Why? Because it's touching your heart, not just your mind. Now, when a person speaks and teaches as if they're singing a song and it touches you that way, then you're captured. What Alter Rebbe was saying, that you can learn Tanya as an academic exercise. And it's brilliant, Tanya. Tanya is, is you can learn it your whole life. It's, it's, the the gainus in Tanya is unbelievable. And you have entire books written on a few lines, how the Alter Rebbe's diuk and this word and that word and how he explains... But the, another side of it is, the, I said before, G'daylim, to go to the G'daylim, to the emotionally mature people, that Tanya is an emotional book. Everything that says there is really not to teach another academic insight into a Maimar Chazal, though it does that, but it's to bring it down to an Eitzah, a personal advice. So you can learn Tater without empathy. We have many teachers like that. As I said, I hope in the women's department it's different. Many people, they taught and they were brilliant and they had a lot to say but there was no empathy. I don't know who coined this line, but I think it's very fitting. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And the teachers that cared are the ones I remember. The rest, I really didn't care about them either, to be honest. It's reciprocal. You know, I remember the few teachers that cared. It wasn't even what they taught. I don't even remember what they taught, to be honest. I remember Rabbi Ushpal. He cared. He used to talk to us. He was the only one that would talk to us about refinement, being a mensch. I remember he was once talking to us about being clean. You have to be clean. And, um, you know, but he spoke about it in such a personal way, like a father, mother calling you in and saying, because I love you, making you feel like uplifted. He wasn't criticizing. He was just speaking. So I remember afterwards, he was standing and speaking with him. I said, why is it so important to be clean? I just wanted to hear. So he says to me, I remember, he, he was like so gentle. He said to me, because uh, Am Yisrael is mamleches kainim v'goy kaddish. You're a kingdom, of, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. A holy person has to be clean. He looked at my nails. He said, they should never have dirt under your nails. He brought it home to that extent. And I, you know what? I never do. Um, my father was also like that, just for the record. Now, you could say, where's the big citizen? This? Where's Avi law? Yehudi law? You know what? 
That's where it comes down home. It's personal. And there's a care involved. And what you teach, you care. And even if you have to fake it, I won't say you shouldn't fake it, but there's a, but the Rebbe, you hear about the Rebbe. What is the thing most people say? They looked at me and like no one else was there. They gave me the time of day. But I'm not even talking about the Rebbe's directives and the Rebbe's brilliance and scholarship. I'll never forget, it was Tov Shinun Rosh uh, Sukkis. You know, Sukkis, if, you were, if some of you remember, when the Rebbe spoke every night, Sukkis, 770, Sukkis was packed, 10,000, wall to wall. It was the first night of Sukkis. The Rebbe walked to his place after Meyer to speak. I stood right under the Rebbe because it was my job, part of the group of people to remember. Mamish, like inches away. The Rebbe was up on the bima, and I was standing on the ground, and the Rebbe's looking around. Everybody's waiting. It doesn't start speaking. And we, no one knew what, what's going on. Then the Rebbe whispers to, to the secretary. He says, Vuza in the Sharf Kinder. Where are the Sharf boys? Uh, <coughs> children. Now, their father had just passed away, I think, a week or two before that. They say, I don't know if it's true or not true, that, that he asked, he wrote to the Rebbe because he had Yana Machla and he wrote to the Rebbe to take care of his children. So here we have 10,000 or more people in the shul, Sukkot night, and of all the things that Rebbe's thinking about, where are the children? Now go find children Sukkot night in 770, right after Mayrev. It's like a needle in a haystack. Who knows where they are? But you know, they started searching. The Rebbe would not speak. He did not speak. Suddenly, the next thing you see, three little boys passing on, you know, like this, like they would do, because there was no room to walk. So they were being, and little kids, easy to pass. They were having fun, you know. And they're suddenly standing right near the Rebbe, and the Rebbe began to speak. After that, every Shabbos, by the Fabrengen, these three kids stood to the right of the Rebbe, Mamish on the Bima, by Fabrengen. And every time the Rebbe would make Kiddush in the beginning of Fabrengen, 1.30, Shabbos day, he would, in an unobtrusive way, no one even noticed it after all. But I never stopped noticing it. The Rebbe would like, pass, take a few pieces of cake from his, uh, from his plate and pass it to them without any drama, without anything. After a while, it became just a custom. But I never forgot it till this day. Here, the Rebbe is about to give a fabrengen, and the Rebbe has a lot of things to share, and he's a Rebbe of the Ganze Welt, and a lot of things on his head. But he never forgot these little children here. So this is called caring, and frankly, that has more impact on people than all the brilliance, to be very honest. Because you see a viable working system. You don't just see ideas. And I know it's something that's not spoken enough as much as it should. People think, what's the big thing? I taught a class. I gave them good ideas. But there's a message when you give ideas and you don't care. And the ideas don't have practical application. That means ideas can be abstract. What was the Alta Friedrich Rebbe so opposed in the early years in the 40s when he said that the teachers in the Talmud Tehidus should be Shemri Shabbos, that teach Shabbos? And, and you know what he was answered? The, the, he was told, Rebbe, you know, when there's a fire burning, the fire of ignorance, then who cares what kind of water you pour in it? Dirty water, clean water. Who cares what kind of teacher it is? At least you have a teacher. You put out the fire of ignorance. So what do you, what do you care if they're Shema Shabbos or not? And the, the Friedrich Rebbe answered, that's true if it was water, dirty water. But what happens if it's kerosene? Then not only are you not putting out the fire, you're actually adding to it. When children learn about Shabbos from someone who's not keeping Shabbos, Begoli, Fahesia, that's a message that you can, that what you learn is not relevant to what you do. You can learn something and not be it. And that was what the Friedrich Rebbe was bothered by, that it was not real. It was a nice idea. You know, we learn about a lot of things. We always take in Simchas Teda, we dance with a Sefer Teda. You know, did you see any scholars, Lahavdal of Shakespeare, of Aristotle, of any school of thought, you ever see them dancing with the works of Shakespeare? They don't dance with it because it's a book. It may be brilliant, maybe a lot of lessons. But for us, Teda is Chayenu Ve'erech Yemenu. It's our life, our sustenance. It's, it's like oxygen. Yes, so we, go, we run into a burning, God forbid, synagogue to save a Sefer Teda just like we would save a life because it's not a book. And say, you know what, I'll write another Sefer Teda. No, it's a child. It's a life. And that is something that's hard to really fully capture, but that's really what ultimate chinuch is when you're teaching Teda. What Chassidus really teaches us is that what you're learning is not just God's gift to us and God's Teda. It's actually our life. It's our oxygen. We can't live without it. And it's indispensable. And it's all the other things I spoke about. 
So there is, a, I would say, a summary, a little of what I would, how I would distill and say what Chassidus adds and how you take Chassidus and apply it to our lives. You know, obviously, there's so much more to say. I have a program, as you all know, Sunday night called My Life Chassidus Applied. I just did episode 268, and the questions keep on coming. So there's plenty there, which I didn't repeat here because that's accessible. But it's all based on these principles. It's taking Chassidus seriously and applying it to our life issues in a way that's caring. Let's go through the five things just briefly. Yeah, I still have to memorize it. Empowering, methodology, character development, the big picture informing the small, the details, dealing with the root to the point of preventive versus remedial medicine, relevance, and finally the empathy of creating emotional intelligence. That it actually Exodus is teaching us to be emotionally healthy people that we can speak to each other, we can communicate, you don't cover up on problems. When you're bothered by something, you find a way to express it, which is all part of making it a real working system. I would like to believe that I think the women of our generation, or maybe of all generations, have some of these qualities naturally more than men do. Men are much more able to escape into cerebral mind games as opposed to emotional intelligence. But... Um, so maybe that's very appropriate here, but it doesn't mean the men are beyond hope. Um, it means that you can help teach them as well, as they say. The men wears the pants, and the woman tells them what pants to wear. <laughs> and the, Rebbe, the language of the Rebbe, Isha Ksheira Esed at Sein Baila, that a uh, appropriate woman, a good woman, either Esed, she fulfills the Ratzon of her husband, or she creates it. And who decides? The woman decides when it's, which one is appropriate based on what the husband is doing or not doing. So you have to use your wisdom. The bin yaseda that a woman has, chokhmas noshim ban sebesa, to be able to apply that all. Well, anyway, I hope I did some justice to a big topic, which is how do you take chassidus and make it relevant? Obviously, there's a lot more. And I could just say from our point of view, and I'll let you know last minutes, I'll be happy to take some questions if you have any is that this is what I, my whole life is dedicated to, to take the Rebbe's teachings, chassidus in general, and make it personally relevant. Not make it, it is personally relevant, but to demonstrate how it's personally relevant. So I have the Sunday night program. We have also the essay contest, which recently we began uh, also working a lot with the schools. There's a school track this year. There was a whole, in so, many schools. So, yeah. So if you, any of you involved in that type of thing, especially next essay contest, we're going to be working closely with the schools to get, you know, Tzfas, for example, they printed a whole book of only the essays, of the essays from that school, the Hebrew and English. We'd love to be able to be in every school, since you're all educators in one way or another. Maybe we can partner. As well as, um, I don't know if Ghani's still here. Is she here? Okay. So we have also, it's interesting, one of the essayists that wrote an essay a few years ago came up with a curriculum idea uh, my Yadus from my life, from California. So we actually published it and made it available, and a lot of people like it. It's about taking essentially Yadus, essentially it's like a calendar for the entire year, and every uh, all the holidays, also Chassidish holidays, how to make it relevant and applied to our lives. So we have that also available. You can contact our office, and if you have any ideas you think we can do and develop, that's what we do. And maybe we can uh, come up with some uh, things that we haven't done yet. But a general mission is to take Siddhis, which is the greatest gift given to us in the language of the Alter Rebbe, the precious stone in the crown, king's crown, that came to help and save this world. So we have to do whatever we can to use it. And please see me as a partner in this, as an asset, an ally, however you want to go. You can go. We've created a whole website now called chassidusapply.com, which focuses completely on this specific thing. We separated from Meaningful Life not because it's a different mission, but the language is more Chassidus language. It's called ChassidusApply.com, full of resources and tools and so on. So, great honor to say, great honor to share a few words with you. I don't know the time, but if you want to have any questions, I'm happy to answer some questions. Yeah, we have some time. Please. Sure, my pleasure, my honor. So we're going to take some questions. What's the time-wise? We have a few minutes for questions. I don't know what's. Uh... I'm done, by the way. Just a quick. I'll take some questions if somebody has. Okay. No, but I mean the sessions are over now. The sessions are ending. Okay. Okay. Um, good. Do you want to go ahead, please? 
Limud? Well, you mean, are you asking me? Well, look. Well, I find the problem the other way around. Most people just uh, read the mimer and they don't know the relevance. That's why I address that. The problem you're describing is a good problem. If they know the relevance and you want to make sure it's grounded, so look, that's why we have sources. And that's why everything is based on, on sources. And um, uh, I, I find, as I said, I don't see that as the problem as much as the problem of relevance. That's what I think is the problem. Well, let me just say, one second, shh. Can I get quite a second? Let me just say this, okay. Um, the first thing I would say is about, which we didn't really address, it was not part of the scope of this, is what to learn when you're learning chassidus. So let's start with that. Chassidus is a lot of material. <clears throat> I think you have to determine when you're going to teach chassidus in a class or in a school, you have to determine, number one, the age of the students, and what they're capable of learning. We do have certain guidelines from the Rebbe, for example, learning Derech Secha, the Mifts of Avis Yisrael is a very a big, one of the earliest things that people learn. Um, there's some selections of certain chapters in Tanya that are good to begin with. And I can give you a list of other things that I've written to different people. I don't think these are a rule, but there's certain basic things. But the question I would have to ask is, who are you teaching it to? If you're talking about 12-year-olds, Five-year-olds, obviously with five-year-olds, we don't really teach uh, chassidus in a full-blown way. You may teach chassidus stories, chassidic stories or chassidic anecdotes and certain principles. What I said earlier in my talk here was that there's the big picture, the spirit of chassidus. That, obviously, you teach from the youngest age. But you don't necessarily teach it with a text. You know, some people... What's that, what's that, what's that? Some people use a yem yem because the Rebbe distilled a lot of ideas in short yim yim. And it all comes down to, as we know as teachers, you have to know your students. It's all the fierach commensurate to the students. So now, what I was saying was that whatever it is that you learn or teach, always connect a relevant message, or else you're basically missing the punchline of chassidus, relevance. Now, you have to give me an example where you find relevance and you don't find it grounded. Who's doing that exactly? I, I haven't seen that happen too much. You have an example of you see relevance without grounding? I see, gra I see the sources without relevance. Is anyone teaching the relevance of chassidus without sources that you know of? No, because when you're explaining a new concept to a student, it might be abstract until you can, I guess, you know. Well, look, if you're the teacher and you're doing that, you need to have sources. Make sure to, to keep you honest. That's exactly what you're saying. Like when I do chassidus applied, I bring sources all the time. That's the thing that keeps you honest and grounded to the source to make sure the original is sources. So if you're actually teaching and you want to make sure it's true, what's your source? That's what I would ask you. So I'm not sure what you're asking me. Well, look. If, if you know how to learn chassidus, you're going to make sure it's true to the original. You're asking me, how do you know that's going to be true to the original? So why don't you run it by someone that's more of an expert in chassidus and ask them, is this true? Do you want me to teach you, like, in five minutes how you no. learn a mimer?
I mean, why, don't, why don't we give me a give me a real scenario? This is too abstract for me. Give me a real scenario. Well, I would, I would, if I were that woman, I would not let you off the hook. I would say, you know what, I can read the Tanya without you, and I've heard in many other classes. I want to know why it's practical. What, do, if, do you have an answer why it's practical? To me, that's the biggest challenge. To, to learn the ideas, there's, there's translations of Tanya. The biggest challenge is practicality. That's why I'm, I'm surprised that you guys have more problem with the relevant, that, that you're looking for the grounding. To me, the challenge is why is it Taka practical? Okay, so good, so fine. Their own path and we're their okay, so what? So what's the question then? So what's the question? Huh? Is there an Indian in learning without? <laughs> One second. One second. You asking me if there's an Indian in learning it without practical? My answer is no, there isn't. The Rebbe says clearly everything has to be made practical. If it's not made practical, you're missing a big part of it. So I'm not sure what's up with that. If your question is to learn abstract without practical, I would say, you have to make it practical. Let me finish. If you're asking me when something is practical, how do you know it's true to the original? You look in the source and you make sure it's grounded. And if you can't do it yourself, you go to someone else to check. I'm not sure what the question is. And, 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 and the reason for that is because probably you're teaching it in a way that's not necessarily accurate to the text because you're teaching it in an abstract way that's not relevant. That's the problem. That's, that's why I spoke for an hour. I've been through this whole system. That's what everybody's been trained to do. That, that everybody's been trained to do exactly that, is to learn something. And you know what? When it comes to the practical, either they forget to mention it or they say it's, it's, it's not what the original says, but it's not correct. That Al Rebbe wrote it to be an eitz in Avedis Hashem, so you could say, I don't know how it's an eitz, and that's what we need to address. But now you're asking me how you take a piece of chassidus and learn it, and then bring it to practical. I'm happy to give you examples. Give me something in chassidus that you don't find that's practical, and I'll, I'll suggest, and I'll show you how it's true to the original. Is that what you're asking? Is that what you're? No, I'm not sure. Is that what you're asking? No, I can give an example or two. This. Big problem, to be honest, but I'll tell you ways that you can do it. I find like this, you know, sometimes they say there's an expression, to know half of an idea is worse than knowing nothing. Because when you know, you heard it already. So it says, I heard it already, Tanya, you don't have to tell me. As you said, they've already developed a detachment or kaltkite. So the way to do it is either um, acknowledging that and saying, you know what, we have to undo maybe the distorted way it was taught. Um, and you have to find creative ways to pique someone's interest. I deal with this all the time. People who went through yeshiva and they're not interested anymore. They said, I heard it all already. Well, you can tell me another take on Tanya. So sometimes that's a, it contaminated them and it's very hard for them to hear. I could tell you that right now. There are many people who cannot hear something in the language of Teda or Chassidus in its original and you have to find completely new language. Sometimes what I do is I use a language that's completely not Teda or Chassidus and then they say, where'd you get that from? And I say... It comes from what you once learned, but I can't use that language because you would be turned off. So it's a challenge. It is a big challenge. Tanya especially, most people, um, Tanya, Tanya remains, for many intelligent people, irrelevant. And it's very hard to teach them the relevance of it. It depends on the individuals. People who've really been hurt in a sense, like, you know, they, they, like, you know I, I know people who tell me, look, I learned Tanya. They told me it was every, all the answers. And then Lahavdla, I learned Buddhism and I really found answers. What do you tell a person like that? Give it another chance? I went my whole childhood I went through that. And actually the people who taught it to me, I don't like them, and they're rude and they're obnoxious. So why would I go back to that? Tell me the answer to that. 
Yeah, but you know, when hurt children are hurt, they don't really, I don't think you can just tell them that easily. Yeah. And, I don't, and especially if they tell you my parents were also happen to be dysfunctional and abusive. Then what do they have? That's why I said, that's why, that, frankly, I think someone teaches chassidus in an irrelevant way or actually in a distorted way, it's better probably not to teach chassidus in the first place. So that's the problem because children are very impressionable and vulnerable. If they learn Teda and Yiddishkeit in the wrong way, it's like what the Friedrich Rebbe said, it's not just dirty water, it's kerosene. So now you have a big, big... I, didn't, I, I don't give up hope on anybody. What I do with anyone that's on that level of distance... My approach to them is, you know what? Why don't we talk a little uh, the language you like to talk? You want to talk a little Buddhism? Fine, we'll talk that spirituality. And I'll show you where it's in the Chassidus. And then they get surprised sometimes. Sometimes that's the way. There's different, there's different approaches. Remember, you have to determine whether it's an intellectual problem or it's an emotional problem. That's a big thing also. Like, you know, a lot of things, a lot of times it's emotional resistance to words. I can tell you myself. I remember when I was first starting, I was like 16 years old, I was in Ocean Parkway, and we, I, was in, I used to go to high school as well, and then after high school we had a, a 45 minutes chassidus. I'm not going to mention the name of the teacher. He was the most boring teacher you've ever heard. His voice was a monotone. It's 7 o'clock at night. We want to go home to eat dinner, you know, after a whole day school. And he taught us Lukut Tate, Adam Kiyakriv, and, he, and, and his voice would drone on like a mosquito in your ear, literally, about Asusa de la Tata, Asusa de Leila, Asusa de la Tata afterwards, Asusa de Leila afterwards. Till this day, I still have a certain allergic reaction to those words. As much as I teach and learn this, the word Asusa de Leila, I have a visceral, like knot in my stomach because of those nights where he made it worse than boring. You know, I've got over it. I, I use the words, but I, I know the reaction. And for me, it was a, it was a subtle thing. I didn't get turned off from the whole thing, but I just remember. That's how children are. You hear the thing in the, in the wrong way. So the answer is, if you make it very exciting and very passionate and very relevant, that's to me, that's the counter effect. I know people who tell me, they listen to my life, they said, I never heard this in yeshiva, and it's quite surprising. First I used to dismiss it, I thought it was your new age version. Because I, I thought my mashpiyam really knew what they're talking about, and you're making it up. Then I came to realize that you're actually the real version, and that was fake, which I found to be a compliment. But a lot of people, I've, I've, I have mashpiyim that told me things I don't even want to share with you. It's a nightmare what they told me. I have a mashpiyah who told me, a mashpiyah in yeshiva. He said to me, what do you think you are? Are you going to make Tanya relevant? Are you kidding me? So I said, what do you do for a living? You're a mashpiyah? You should go sell shoes. Why are you a mashpiyah? You, you, you don't believe in your own product. But he told me, he says, you're going to make Tanya relevant? I said, so what's Tanya here for? is going to refine, you know, like completely. I said, was it ever relevant? He said, maybe the, the, the Talmudim of the Alter Rebbe. So here's a guy. He's stating it openly. A guy who's mashpiyat to students. To me, he's a destructive force. He doesn't believe in his own product. You don't do that even if you're selling uh, pizza. You either believe in it or you don't believe in it. But we have been, unfortunately, um, a lot of it has been distorted. and uh, And I think... There should be classes in learning a mimer, so this properly, grounded in the mimer. I'm not suggesting to jump to the relevance. I didn't suggest here at all, skip chsidis and just go to relevance. I said learn it with the relevance. That's what I said. And, and, and make sure it's, it's grounded. There's always that challenge. You know, the Evan Abuichen, I was just going to say, the litmus test of an idea is if it can be practically applied. If not, it's just an idea. This is true in science. It's true in any theory. If you, the theory doesn't, we want to know if it works, you have to try it out in real time. If someone says, Moyach Shalat al Alev and Tanya, you have control over your emotions. And then you say to me, I've never seen it work. What does that tell you? The Dal Tadeb spoke to whom? Does Moyach Shalat al Alev work or does it not work? Can you give me an effective methodology teaching people how they should have self control and the mind should control the impulsive emotions when they want to act out? Huh? Okay, so be. So can you can and, and okay, but without CBT, did we know how to do that? No, but before Tanya, before CBT existed, how was it done? Who says we? Maybe, maybe we did, and some people just didn't do it.
Very good. So, so that's why the Rebbe says, have a mashpia and a selach harav, to make sure, to get an objective opinion, which one is which. It's true. Of course. And Rabbi Nochem Chernobler had this problem with its Zdaka issue. Should he give it to one person or to many? Until he realized that the Yetzirah is basically stopping him from giving it altogether. So there are, there are different uh, methods, so to speak. It's a very good question. You have an answer? You want my answer? I was like, I mean, I have what I answer. I'd rather hear it's similar to what I heard from somebody who said to me, why should I ever learn time? How do you get to the class because I'm never going to get into it? Okay. <laughs> good questions. My son said that to me. Many people think really that way. Yeah. So what are your answers? Do you want my answer? Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I would rephrase the whole thing. What, what, what is a bainity exactly? Let's define what a bainity is before we... If, if a Benini is not an, a, a, an admirable type of person you want to become, of course no one's going to want to be a Benini. Most people think a Benini is a guy who has no fun because he's busy constantly, continuously controlling his thought, speech, and action. And he, may, he has a Yetzirah, but he's not letting it act. So what kind of, you know, who wants to be a life like that, right? So maybe we have to redefine the Benini in a little more exciting terms. That someone says, you know what, I want to be like it. You know, that, let's be honest. Who are our heroes? whether they're sports or Hollywood or so on, is because you want to be like them. You, you like them, whatever. It could be shtusim completely and even negative influences, but they look good to you. They look good. They physically look good. Okay, so let's, how do we make, so the question is... It has to be No, I meant, but I meant like a hero where something you want to be like. People who see actors or actresses or other stars, in their own fantasy, they say, I'd like to be like that. That's a cool person. That's, so I'm, that's, that's why I'm using that language. So let me answer. So, so, so here's the question. How do you make a Baini fashionable and exciting and, uh, and, and, and cool, right? That's the question. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point, but that's obvious, obviously. We're talking about Tanya. So here's a few points I would make. It depends who I would be speaking to. But um, uh, excellence in life, in any field, is always based on discipline. The problem is that discipline per se, people don't like the word discipline. Like for example, when you say the word no, you can't do something. Most people, why, should I, why are you telling me no? I want to do it. Why should I be no? However, when you look at any good admirable position, and I'm going to use secular examples, in a moment, you'll see the no is never seen as a no. It's seen as a way of getting the yes. So, for example, um, people who love tennis. Look at tennis champions and look at their disciplines. Their disciplines can be compared to a Moyak Shaltal of Tanya. And you see the excellence that came through not just doing whatever they want. They wake up in the morning, they have a particular diet, certain exercises. Look at great pianists, musicians. All of them disciplined, people in the military. That's very hard, but they come out to be excellent because they've learned to harness their challenges. They don't get rattled. They get, don't get impulsive. Things happen, they know how to deal with a crisis. And anyone looks at them and say, wow, that, how'd that person become that way? So the, the, the concept of a disciplined life where you don't just do whatever you like, I would show people, before I would get to the Baini of Tanya, how that is key to all success. The Alter Rebbe takes it one step further, that it's spiritual success. So that success is also businessmen who are making a lot of money wake up 5 o'clock in the morning. Who wants to wake up 5 o'clock in the morning? And they're disciplined. Every second is calculated. So then now you say the Alter Rebbe's aspiration for a human being wasn't just to make money or play tennis or be a musician. It was to change the world in some way, to be a person that brings that brings. If you want, I'll use the word Gula, that brings Mashiach to the world, that change, brings world peace, 
that transforms the world. It's just as admirable, if not more admirable, than all these professions I just mentioned. And therefore, to get there, there's a process called discipline. Because if you just follow your impulses, using from Tanya Pedic test, the mitis, you're going to go wherever, you know, every second you'll be seduced by something else. When you use moyach, you, so I would use examples from the secular world of excellence and bring it back then to the Tanya and show that the Alter Rebbe is not teaching us what not to do. He's telling us, for you to be the best person you can be in this world and to achieve serious goals, you need to have a high level of discipline, which is, in other words, Mayach Shal Talev. Now, but then, but then the next question is, you know what? It's more exciting for me to be a tennis player or a musician than to be a person who is bringing spirituality to the world. So then the job is, how do we explain that how a Benini of Tanya will be the best possible person in life, a person who really will achieve his mission in life. And that goes into a whole set of discussion of what is a mission and why you're here, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the direction I would take. Obviously, I'm being brief, but that's the approach I would take. I would take. I would start from the scratch. I would not start with, uh, you know, a Benini is not to do a Vedas, not to give into your Taivas. That's the conventional language. It's more... What you should become, and the way to become that, requires discipline not to do other things. Now, what's that? let me answer this. As far as becoming a full Baini, so the Rebbe already explains in tiny, the Alta Rebbe says that a Baini is someone who never did an Aveda and never will do one. Which means as soon as you did one Aveda in your life, you're disqualified. So then the whole Tanya, then, what, then what's Pedi Kedala? Then it says, Midas Kabbalah, at any moment you could be a Baini. So the Rebbe explains, it's Echus, it's a qualitative state. That you, even though you may have done an Aveda yesterday, Today, you can get into that state of discipline as if you are now. So the goal, basically, I would, tra- re- I would re- re- replace the word Bainini with the most, dis- the, most, the most excellent person on this earth who's channeling all his energies to, to re- make a real impact. That's a whole different way of looking at it. Of course, I, that's what I told you. I, I, I'm, everything I do today is fighting that language, to be honest. But the problem is, a lot of our insiders, when you don't use the language, they think you're speaking alien ideas. I'm telling you, people tell me. When I say this, they'll say, no, that's not the Baini of Tanya. What did I say now that's not consistent with Tanya? Not one word. It's all Tanya. Because that's the trap of the comfort. It's like... Yep. And I'm thinking to myself, here, the goal is so strong, we're raising kids and this generation so hard, and then the one thing that we have that can help our kids, we're basically taking away because we can't think of a way of making it be an answer for them. So I think, I mean, like, I, I definitely got and hear that we're all fully, oh, I finally we're see that we're all right. free. I know, yeah, we're like much more in tune. Like, we're so much more aware. aware. We don't even have to be that. We, we, can, we have to be qualified to teach your, your professional. Well, what do you think I... I Let me tell you something. What do you, what, what? No. Because they may, they may be threatened by me, for all I know. Look, I look. there's a reason I do my life, because it's applied. It's not because I have nothing to do with my life. Because I know it has um, an impact. There's around 10,000 people who watch a week. 10,000. Okay. No, one second. I'm not saying it to toot my horn. I'm saying it because I, I didn't believe it would be that way. But it's caught on. And I get questions from every direction. And I especially take every week an Indian Exodus and explain it in a relevant way. You know, I don't just answer questions. And that's a challenge. Look, God blessed me with a little gift, but I'm not the only one I think that can do it. I learned a lot from the Rebbe. And I also have a little courage to go out of the conventional language that are the crutches that we use all the time. You have to have courage. And you have to, and there's nothing wrong with checking with someone if there's, I have no problem saying at times, I know, I know, I have no problem. Someone says, no, I will tell you, I have, I have, sometimes someone st- sends me a note or something and I stand corrected. I, I have no problem saying I was wrong. Because if I find that something I said, I, I want to, I, I'm, I'm looking for the truth. I'm not looking to be. So look, we, our community needs this more than anybody else. You need some courage. And it needs to be grounded and so on and so forth, you know?
Yes, I can tell you right now, there are people who are very much, let's call it the conservative, narrow, almost in the box Chabadniks, who are very frightened and threatened by something like what I'm doing. They don't have, they can't put their finger on it because I was a, I'm a chazer, a maniach, I have the credentials. I'm not some new age rabbi that came from Berkeley, you know. Um, um, so I have the credentials, so they don't know what to do with that. But they, they are frightened a bit by that it's a little too much out of the box. So I try to say it in a way, I don't want to either, I'm not looking to frighten them either, I'm not looking. When I was younger, I would have probably done it in their face just to have tzolochus. But today, I'm looking that they should also appreciate it. And, and, and sometimes you need to find the right words. And so on. Listen, that there is a certain because it's it is true. You could you know you have the things like the call the chauffeur and other movements, and you start saying is it correct the mic drop and this thing and that thing you know. And some say it is and some say it isn't. The rabbis themselves can't even agree. It's one big bahala. It's one big mess. I mean, I'm I'm a person who's completely grounded. By me, I worked in the sikhs. I come from a place of sources. I'm not talking, uh, you know, uh, new age mumbo jumbo of modern age, you know? I know how to speak the modern language, but it's all taken by me chassidus. I don't take a drop from anything else. I'm not, I'm very, I'm a big purist. I'm sure the world has no, no, because I, but I know some of our teachers who do use Buddhist ideas, and they do use, and may not even be unkosher, but they, their sources are not necessarily always from, no, there's some of them are taking those ideas and turning it into language of chassidus. To me, chassidus has it all. The, now, English, obviously we need to use English. Chassidus doesn't speak in English, the original. So you need to use that language. But I think there are more and more people who are being trained in this methodology, and I'm, I think I'm part of it. I mean, when I wrote Toward a Meaningful Life, which is now 24 years, it was very new. People never heard the Rebbe's Tater presented that way. And I can tell you right away, even then I was, it was critical, but then once people started liking the book, then everybody said, great book, you know, because they saw the results. And it's all grounded. Huh? Because, because it... it it was a language, it was, it was very, it was like a language that people thought maybe is self-help, it's about the self-actualization. You know, they didn't realize that, number one, I took it all from sources. You know, they thought maybe I went too far out. But it's fine, it's everything, it's not, no one has that complaint anymore. It wasn't so, there wasn't the word the mundane, it was more that it was, I was not using Hebrew words. I didn't words, iskafia, you don't see iskafia there, or ishapcha, or, you know, kabbalah sale. I use words that are far more English. You know, like I just was in Australia last week. Now, let me just show you something. I got an email from a guy, a bocher, because I bring a few hours there with the bocher. I was telling them how to learn chassidus. So a guy writes to me. I want to just read something to you. I was, I was very touched by it, actually. Guy okay, Mendy, his name is Mendy. He writes to me like this. Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. Thank you very much for your shir and for bringing the yeshiva gedela. That's the main yeshiva there. I thoroughly enjoyed and feel that I gained a lot from both. Would you be able to suggest some alternative ways to say, describe the following ideas in Torah? And he wants me to like to, Mashiach, I'll tell you what I wrote in each one. I sent them back because I, I, you know, I was very touched by his question. He asked me, Mashiach, prayer, traditional, tshuva, kabbalah, sel, yira, avedus Hashem. He wanted me to translate how I would translate it. Right. He got the idea. He got not, not using the crutch of the Hebrew words. So for Mashiach, I wrote global spiritual visionary, teacher and leader. By prayer, I wrote service of the heart, emoting with God. Traditional, I wrote grounded in 4,000 years of tradition. Tshuva, return, reconnect, realign. Kabbalah sale, accepting, surrendering to a reality greater than yourself. Yira, I wrote awe, respect. Avedis Hashem, I wrote fulfilling your higher calling, exerting yourself to serve. So this, that's an example. Once you show that, people, that there is a way to do that, it changes everything because you're not trapped in the word anymore. Now you say, you know what? Like, for example, surrendering to a, a, a reality greater than yourself. Wow, that's an interesting way of putting Kabbalah sale. Most people see Kabbalah sale as a stick over your head. You know, be a Kabbalah sale and they can stop uh, making trouble. You know, like that. So there we are. The revolution has begun. Okay, that's it. We're, be well, everybody. Um, there's a... What is your name?